welcome to Mosaic. I'm your host, Susan Shulman Pertnoy. Mosaic is Jewish Federation of Palm Beach County's weekly news magazine, exploring the most critical issues facing Jews here and around the world. Young Jews seem to have a more complex relationship with Israel than past generations. Today, we're talking with Michael Solomonov, whose Israeli-inspired restaurant empire proves that food may be the great uniter. We'll be right back with Mosaic. You are the book that lights the spark and the hand that passes the torch, the fuel that powers the change that betters the world across town, across oceans, the hand that soothes the spirit that survived the unthinkable. You are there in the darkest of times to strengthen our community. Moving in storage, your superhero movers. More moving horror stories. Slick salesman makes you a great deal. Sleazy movers hold everything hostage until you pay a higher fee. There a mover out there. As a former police officer, I've heard all of the moving horror stories. But you can trust me and my pros, and we'll have you saying, Opa! Call Star Star Greek. Good Greek, moving in storage, your superhero movers. Picture living aboard a luxury cruise ship with first-class service and the best amenities 24-7. Life at Tradition is just like a cruise ship that doesn't leave port. With more fabulous food, more fun with friends and family, a more fulfilling future, more care when you need it, and more freedom when you don't. Our elegant assisted living residences provide so much more, so you can make the most of every day. Rent an apartment at Morse Life and see how much more life can be. Joining us today is award-winning chef Michael Solomonov. Welcome to Mosaic. It's a thrill to have you with Thank us you. today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. I know you were born in Israel. Tell us about your upbringing. So my dad was born in Bulgaria but moved to Israel when he was like, you know, a year old in 1948. My mom grew up in East Liverpool, Ohio um, and was the daughter of a pediatrician. And uh, they just spent a lot of time going back and forth to Israel. My grandfather was very big in Israel bonds um, and was really involved in that. So I think that they just always grew up going to Israel. And my mom made Aliyah wow. in, in the 70s, met my dad. And then my dad, being Israeli, wanted to move to the States, you know, to be a, a jeweler, <laughs> of course, like his birthright, you know. and. Um, <laughs> So I grew up in Squirrel Hill, Pittsburgh, which is like a shtetl, you know? And then when I was 15, we made Aliyah and moved back. And how was that for you, being in the States? That must have been tough. Not easy, yeah, it was a really difficult. I went to an American boarding school and sort of convinced my parents to let me just stay for one year and then move back to the States. But it was hard, 15 is a weird it age. It is, to move anywhere. To move anywhere, and also I think it was, it was much harder. My little brother David, who was born in the States, uh, basically assimilated. I went to an American boarding school for one year, and David just stayed and sort of became Israeli. Mm. And that was like bar mitzvah year, so somehow even more difficult than what I was going through. So I read somewhere that you were a very picky eater as a kid, and you even hated tomatoes. So where did you find your passion for food? That's a great question. You know, whenever I'm trying to force my kids to eat something now, I remember <laughs> that I was like the most difficult eater of all time. I think that I actually got into food or became more um, experimental or adventurous with food when I started cooking it and when I started like making it and literally getting my hands in there. So I'm not sure when, you know, I mean, I've, I've loved food before. I just was very sort of narrow and, and the way that I ate. But I think once I started cooking and once you start tasting things over and over again, it's not sort of forced by your parents, right? That's like right, how that's most true, that's decisions true. are made in your life, right? Yes. Your parents force it, you reject it, and then later on like So you do you that, that to your kids? <laughs> no, no, I'm still, I, I try to, I try to bribe them with dessert, provided that they eat certain things which I don't think is that good, but it's okay. How much of an influence was your grandmother's cooking on your love for food? Uh, definitely the most. I mean, I, I come from 
a long line of great cooks. My parents were both good cooks. My uh, grandmother was an amazing cook. And uh, so I think that her, you know, we didn't speak, I didn't speak Hebrew until I was much older. So, and she spoke virtually no English. So there wasn't a lot of shared language, you know, and her cooking That's was- be difficult. I kind of, except for that her cooking and my loving of her cuisine, I think was like what sort of brought us close. And, you know, the things like borekas that I just grew up with. And a lot of Jews um, don't even know what that is, but it was such a relevant thing. I don't know what it is. Okay, see? So sorry. So borekas are very important, right? They were uh, the dough, this sort of like puff pastry, if you will, probably came from medieval Spain, post-Inquisition, where my family came from, or my dad's side of the family. So that's Sephardic? Sephardic, yep. And so after the Inquisition, they were kicked out of Spain, moved, ended up in the Balkans, uh, conquered by the Ottomans, who stuffed these borekas with like feta cheese, probably, and then brought it to Israel. And, and I would eat these pastries, just thinking they were these like savory sort of turnovers, not realizing that they told the story of my family, you know? So it, um, not only were they delicious and sort of like spiritually sustaining or something, they just really, um, you know, they, they, they talked about my lineage without even having to talk about it. So, so interesting. Yeah, it was fascinating. Uh, you have had extensive experience with Italian cuisine yes. and French food. Why did you choose to focus your culinary endeavors with Israeli cuisine? There's probably a couple different answers to that. I think the easiest one is that nobody was really doing it. And we would spend all this time, you know, there's so many rules with cooking. Um, and I grew up with like French sort of, um, I don't know, I guess sort of, fr I, I went to culinary school here, mostly French chefs. I worked with Italian chefs that are more relaxed, but they still have rules and there are a lot of parameters. And the thing about Israel, A, it's like a hundred different gastronomies and it's like thousands of years of diaspora. It's like conflict, so it's, like a it's melting commonality, pot. it's everything. Um, and I would go back to Israel repeatedly while cooking these other cuisines and wonder why nobody was doing this, you know? And that was it. And you've got all these like grandmothers that determine how to make good food in Israel, which I found to be great, you know? You also talk about food as a universal connector, also sort of a culinary diplomacy, so to speak. Can you elaborate on that? Well, I think the beautiful thing about food is that it doesn't really lie, you know? And I think that at the end of the day, provided that it's good, it's appreciated. So I think, not saying that we're gonna like crack open a challah and create peace in the Middle East, but the problem with what, um, in my view is happening now is that everybody's so polarized and you have to decide what side you know of the sort of fence so to speak that you're, you're on and I just find that to be opposite of like hospitality and the treatment that you get going into anybody's home uh, in Israel and I, and I feel like that is a bridge uh, that we need to cross I think that there are a lot of there are a lot of like nuances that you don't really understand here, but over there, everybody is sort of pushed together. So you can be Israeli, Palestinian, you can be Russian, Ethiopian, Druze, you can be a Sudanese refugee. We all eat in the same place. Right, the commonality is food. There is commonality with it, and I feel like that, you know, and I feel like instead of focusing on conflict and sort of practicing what it is that we preach in hospitality or what you do when somebody shows up to your home and the way that you treat them if you just expand upon that in your thinking then we're then we're somewhere and at least we can have a discussion or a conversation because as you know especially here in the states it's very difficult to hold your ground as a jew to somebody that believes in uh the right of uh you know, the right to Jews to having a, a country. It's very difficult, especially from afar, um, to make a case or to have an argument without these like weird gray areas. We have to take a break. We'll be right back after this brief message. Coming up, more with celebrated Israeli-American chef, Michael Salomonov.
You are the book that lights the spark and the hand that passes the torch, the fuel that powers the change that betters the world across town, across oceans, the hand that soothes the spirit that survived the unthinkable. You are there in the darkest of times to strengthen our community. Eat, drink, and enjoy Shabbat services at Temple Beth El's Friday Night Happenings. Cocktail reception and kosher dinner at 5.30, followed by our creative, musically-driven Shabbat service. Traditional to progressive, the food and music change every Friday, and you'll want to stay for complimentary dessert. Plan to spend the whole evening here, and you'll walk away and you'll say, Wow, we're coming back next week. Welcome at Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat services at Temple Beth El. Open to everyone. Join us every Friday night. Good Greek, moving in storage, your superhero movers, moving horror stories. Hey, I heard you're looking for a mover. I got a deal for you. Staring on his mover out there! As a former police officer, I've heard all of the moving horror stories. But you can trust me and my pros, and we'll have you saying... Opa! Call Star Star Greek. Good Greek, moving in storage, your superhero movers. Are you concerned about the rise of anti-Semitism and other challenges facing the Jewish community? Join us in doing something about it. Jewish Federation of Palm Beach County has a variety of opportunities for you to stand up for what you care about by advocating, volunteering, learning, and connecting. Visit jewishpalmbeach.org upcoming for a full list of opportunities coming up near you. We're back with award-winning chef Michael Solomonov talking about food and his love of Israeli cuisine. You opened in 2008 your now award-winning restaurant Zahav, right in the middle of the recession. Yes. How difficult was that for you? It was not a great year for us. I mean, I don't think, you know, in addition to the economy falling apart, um, the Philly, Phillies won the World Series, which is awesome if you own a bar with a television in it. Um, so nobody was really going out. Um, the economy wasn't great. I was struggling with um, like substance abuse issues. I mean, it was the worst case scenario for a restaurant opening. And yet, and we almost closed actually. Um, when we opened, you know, we opened in May 2008. I had to call my father in Israel and ask him, to borrow money to make payroll in like November. Well, I would imagine, you know, back then, uh, you say something is an Israeli restaurant, there's a stereotype that one right, goes to like, oh, it's another falafel joint. Right. How did you overcome that? Well, I think that for us, you know, we wanted to be the anti-falafel because that's what everybody thinks. They think of falafel, hummus, maybe shakshuka, but the reality is you've got, you know, so many different kinds of cuisine in one place. So I think that it took, uh, it took us a while to figure out how to articulate what this cuisine was. And in that period, we were like also opening a restaurant in the worst possible climate. Economy, right. Yeah. So it, it was not a great, it was a, it was a pretty rough time. But I think that going through that and going through, um, you know, having to be like resourceful on such a human, emotional level, I think was really important. And for us, it's sort of like this ethos that we have in our company now. We want to be part of concepts that make sense to us and that we're invested in. Because had we not cared so much about Israeli food or advocating for Israel through food, then we could have just closed, I think. Well, you obviously are sensation right yeah. now. <laughs> How do you balance being creative with your food and staying authentic to Israeli cuisine? That's a great question. I think that there's no real way to answer that. I think that what we do is start by tradition and we take a time and place and we take a cuisine or multiple cuisines that exist in Israel and then we apply it to the produce that we can get or the ingredients that we can get in Eastern Pennsylvania, right. which obviously is a very different um, you know, a very different place, uh, sort of agriculturally or even temperature-wise right. than, um, than anywhere in Israel. 
and most of the Middle East. And then we use things like spices and techniques to really like help imply tradition. You know, and my intro, I'm not interested in somebody coming in and saying, this is better than my grandmother's, which it ne never is. But what I want them to do is take a bite of the food and say, this reminds me. Yeah, it's an experience. Of, of a time and place. That's what I want. So we get to use a hundred different cuisines. We get to use local farms and we use fantastic spices and charcoal and wood burning ovens and to, to make this sort of experience. You have a restaurant empire in Philadelphia. Why Philly? Well, I actually moved to Philly from like West Palm Beach randomly uh, because it was on the way to New York. And the, uh, my girlfriend at the time had a brother that lived in Philly, so we sort of stopped there and stayed. Wow. That's... Broke up with her, <laughs> stayed in Philly. Yeah. You and your business partner, Steve Cook, just opened a brand new restaurant, Laser Wolf. I think it's your eighth, is that true? Yeah, so Laser Wolf is, well, it's our eighth concept. Okay. We've, got, um, we've got like five Federal Donuts, three Deezing on three Goldies, so I think it might be our 16th restaurant, but. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's a new concept for us. It's a Shipudia, which is a, like a skewer house or kebab house named after the butcher and Fiddler on the Roof. Yes, that's so funny. Yeah, did you know? I did, okay. because I know the story and I, right. it, I, it had to be. I thought it was so funny when yeah. I heard it. So we have a big butcher case with all the skewers when you walk in. And it's, um, it's, amazing. it's four days old right now. Amazing. And it's doing really well, luckily. So your other restaurants are, each have a unique personality. Um, tell us about that. And first, I want to ask you, who's Abe Fisher? That's a great question. So <laughs> Abe Fisher, it's Steve's family is Abe, and uh, my family is Fisher, uh, my mom's side. So oh. it's our like Ashkenazi family sort of conversion. I, well, I found out though that my great grandfather's name was actually Abe Fisher, but I found out after we had opened the restaurant. So it's more of a it's sort of an homage to um, like Central European, but really North American Jewish cooking, um, sort of reinvented and respun. And what and your other types of food that you're so we do Goldie, which is a falafel shop, Dizengoff, which is a hummusia. We've got a place called Kfar, which is like um, sort of an all day bakery cafe, and Merkaz, which is like a pita sandwich place. But you have something that's very what is very special to me. It's Rooster, and uh, what, yeah. what do you do with the proceeds of Rooster? Well, so Rooster was a place that we uh, would use all of the sort of chicken parts to fe from Federal Donuts, which is our donut and fried chicken place. Sounds and amazing. we make matzo ball soup with it, and 100% of the proceeds going to hungry Philadelphians. That's a beautiful thought. Yeah. We have to take our final break. We'll be right back after this message. Coming up, we'll talk about how food is the universal bridge builder. You are the book that lights the spark and the hand that passes the torch, the fuel that powers the change that betters the world across town, across oceans, the hand that soothes the spirit that survived the unthinkable. You are there in the darkest of times to strengthen our community. Morse Life Memory Care is making a difference in the lives of our residents with innovative programs that offer them a more rewarding future. Our goal is to give our residents more time. Time for programs that help cognition, for favorite foods in our open kitchen any time of day, for fun with new friends, and time for family, free from care and worry. Most importantly, for the compassion and dignity they deserve. What's the best kept secret in new cars? It's that you can get a brand new Mini at Brandon Mini Palm Beach for under $21,000, which includes free maintenance for three years. No kidding. Plus, free membership to the fun Mini Club of South Florida for road trips and autocross, and even more with club room social events. Mini is more than just driving. It's about having fun with the Brayman Mini community. Learn about Brayman Mini at BraymanMini.com. Mini's for under $21,000. Free maintenance, Mini Club, and Club Brayman benefits. It's a no-brainer. Brayman Mini is the right choice. 
We're back with Michael Solomonov. Your restaurant, Zahav, was awarded the 2019 James Beard Foundation Outstanding Restaurant of the Year, which basically means you're the best restaurant in the country. And you personally, in 2017, were, won the James Beard Foundation Award for Best Chef. And you've also won num numerous accolades and awards throughout the year. Has, how do you, with all this fame and fortune, how do you stay grounded and focused? Well, the beautiful thing about restaurants is that it doesn't really matter. I mean, the awards are incredibly validating. They are a dream come true. I mean, they're um, never in a million years did we think that, that we would be capable of this. Having back-to-back -back years of an Israeli restaurant winning national awards is like my life's work, right? But, um, you know, every single day at 5 p.m., the curtain goes up and we have to prove ourselves again to another 250 people that are waiting to, to have their expectations exceeded. So it's very easy to stay humble. Um, and it's, I think you're only sort of as good as the last dish that you make. And, you know, we have a lot of them to make. So it's, it's quite, quite easy. Mike, why do you think people are so emotionally tied to food? Well, I think that we all share the, everybody loves food. Right, and I think that there is such a visceral experience when you eat food. Um, the people that you're with, uh, whether it's like holidays, whether it's like in the street, you know, at 2 a.m., and you have this sort of taste memory that will stay with you for the rest of your life. Um, and Jews in particular, I mean, our holidays are, are revolve around food. True. Right? So yes. I think it's, and not just, not just like major holidays, but I mean, Shabbat, like every, Friday and Saturday, we, you know, and, and if you're kosher, you know, a discussion about the way that you live your life is around food. So I think that it would be sort of hard to avoid it, but food gives us such pleasure and it tells such a huge story and it's a way to reconnect. And my relationship to my grandmother wouldn't be what it was without food. Our Jewish Federation recently conducted a community-wide study to f find out where we are and where we're going as a, as a Jewish community. And one of the questions was, how do we connect young Jews to their Judaism? And we found out that they connect in different ways, mostly culturally, through food, wine, music. Uh, what, were you, are you surprised at that? I'm not surprised at that. I mean, I think that we're constantly looking at ways to reconnect, and I think it's very easy um, I mean, we sort of joked about this before, but like <laughs> my parents forcing me to go to synagogue for my bar mitzvah years every single Saturday wasn't like a reason for me to be super excited about Judaism or identity. Um, being forced to move to Israel at 15, I wasn't like, rah, 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 let's talk about like Sephardic pastries that <laughs> promote like medieval Spanish Jewry, right? Um, but the older you get, you look for reasons. And I think food, is a very easy one. It really de doesn't matter where you are in your observance. It doesn't mar matter where you are politically. It is something that we can ra rally behind. Do you see food as a connector for you in your life for, for Judaism? 100%, of course. And we've been able to advocate for, for, um, for Judaism and for Israel without having to fight, without having to hate, without having to argue or disagree. So, of course, and people come into the restaurant and whether they're like upset with, I don't know, whether they're rejecting their religion, uh, you know, as a way to rebel against their parents, whether they're like totally not interested, whether politically they don't feel comfortable, um, you know, they love what it is that we do. And that's kind of all that I want. That's a beautiful thing. What a, re what a result. Yes. Uh, you've also written two cookbooks. We have one here now. Yes. And you wrote your first one called Zahav. Yes. That's supposedly an oral history. It's described as an oral history. Yeah. Do you want to, can you talk about that? Sure. So it's, it, it is about, it's, it's Israeli food through this restaurant in Eastern Pennsylvania, but it is, uh, talks about Israeli history, talks about my family's personal history, and the history of the opening of the restaurant. And it's pretty comprehensive, but it's very personal. Our, you know, I'm Israeli, I grew up in the States, so 
reconnecting with Israel is something that I kind of do in real time. And I think that part of our success is the ability to be the sort of conduit between Israel and the West. Um, and to help articulate and help describe and also not like alienate and sort of invite people in to this journey that we're taking. Do you have any favorite recipes that you'd like to tell us about? Well... That are in the books? Yeah, I've got maybe? a couple of them. Um, so in Zahav, my mom's coffee braised brisket is a, a favorite of mine. Um, we make this tabbouleh, but we make it actually with quinoa, which is very good oh. in the English peas. It's quite delicious. And, you know, my grandmother's borikos are in there too. They take a little bit of time, but they're worth it. I'm sure they are. Yeah. So with all that you do, what's next for Michael Solomonov? Well, I would like just like a weekend off, you know, <laughs> they call it all vacation. We have a lot of really exciting things. Um, the fact of the matter is we've got like 16 restaurants, 350 employees. Wow. Zahab is approaching its 12th year and we're the busiest we've ever been. So I think it's really about reflecting and turning in and figuring out how to reinvent, which is what we kind of have to do. To stay relevant. To stay relevant and to stay invigorated. How about expanding? Any, any coming to Palm Beach anytime soon? I actually love. Uh, I love. I do love South Florida, and I think that in many ways South Florida gets a bad rap. And it's you know cold and rainy right now in Philadelphia, and today was like seventy-eight degrees, and I just went on a run here. So maybe Palm Beach. <laughs> Well, you've heard it first right yeah. here. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining Thank us. You. Thanks for having me. Mosaic is brought to you by these generous sponsors and underwriters. Learn how you can support Mosaic by visiting jewishpalmbeach.org slash mosaic.